Welcome to COIQ, a first of its kind video program about health innovators, early adopters, and influencers, and their stories about riding the roller coaster of healthcare innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy, founder of Legacy DNA Marketing Group, and it's time to raise our COIQ. Welcome back, COIQ listeners. On today's show, I have Mike Moyer with me. He is the author of Slicing Pie, and today we're going to be digging a little bit deeper into what is slicing pie and how does it impact or how can health innovators benefit from this conversation and benefit from his book. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you very much for having me. So tell our audience, before we dig um, any deeper, tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. I am a career entrepreneur. I've spent my life going from startup companies to real jobs, to startups to real jobs, back and forth. I've worked in all kinds of industries, ranging from fine wine to motorhome chassis to senior living to fishing tackle boxes. So wow, that is diverse. <laughs> a lot of different areas I've worked in. Um, in the past six or eight years, I've run a company called Fair and Square Ventures, where I've, done, I've written a number of books and run some software companies. I have a camping gear company. And uh, I teach uh, at the University of Chicago or at Northwestern University and a previously University of Chicago Business School. Nice. What do you teach? Entrepreneurship. Of course. (laughs) So what is slicing pie? Hmm. Slicing pie is an equity model for early stage bootstrap startups. So one of the key problems that one of the first deals that founders do is a deal between each other. And typically what happens is you and I will go start a company together and we'll go in 50, 50 because we're friends and then you do all the work and I own half the company. Mm-hmm. And this is a common problem all over the world. And slicey pie solves the problem by creating a perfectly fair equity split. It's the only model on the planet that actually creates a fair equity split. Every other, every other method for splitting equity creates an unfair split. So, you know, this topic um, is, seems to be a really hard and emotional topic for health innovators. Well, for any entrepreneur, um, but, you know, in the context, our listeners are health innovators. Um, Mm -hmm. So explain to us a little bit about, you know, how does your model help Mm -hmm. us work through some of that difficulty and the emotions of giving a piece of your company away? Well, it's hard because it's very ambiguous <clears throat> and we struggle between our want to be, our need to be gener- generous with each other and our need to be greedy with our, our greed. We, we want as much as we can for ourselves, but we also want to be generous and we want them to feel right about it. And so it creates a lot of problems, mm-hmm. but it's really not a very complicated problem. Um, do you know how to play, black, how to play blackjack? Mm-hmm. Let's pretend that you and I are going to play blackjack together as a team, not as opponents, but as a, as a, as a team. And we're going to split the winnings 50-50 because we're friends. So we go to Las Vegas. We each put a dollar on the same hand of blackjack. We don't know if we're going to win. We don't know how much we're going to win. We don't know how long it's going to take to win. The future is unknowable, right? Yeah. We hope we're going to win. We're hopeful. We're optimistic. We're playing because we think we're going to win. But the odds aren't really in our favor, but we're still playing. So the dealer deals two aces. So what do you do with those aces? Split them. Split them and double down, right? <laughs> I'm out of cash and you're not. So you put two more dollars down. So now you bet three dollars and I've only bet a dollar. We still have no idea what the future holds. You don't know if we're going to win or how much we're going to win or how long it's going to take. The future is still just as unknowable as it was before. We're still optimistic. But we know what we know for sure, though, is that you bet three dollars and I bet a dollar. If we win, does 50 50 sound fair? Well, it depends on which place that you're in, right? <laughs> Well, it should be 75, 25, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and unless I was the one that was getting the extra 25%. <laughs> yeah, you, you, bet, you bet $3, I bet a dollar. So I should get 25%, you should get 75%. Sure. That is a logical, yep. obvious, unambiguous answer based on the facts of the case. There's no other way to split it. I have a deal for 50-50. I could sue you and probably win. But that would make it fair. Right. What's fair is that your share of the winnings should be based on your share of the bets. So startups are exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. Instead of betting on our cards, we're betting on ideas. We bet our time and our money and our facilities and our relationships and our equipment and our supplies. We contribute all kinds of things to a startup for which we're not paid. That amount that we're not paid is equal to the fair market value of that contribution. And that represents our bet. 
So when you bet your time, you're betting the fair market value of your time. You're not betting more than that. You're not betting, betting less than that. If you're worth $100,000 a year and you work for me for a year, you bet $100,000 on unpaid compensation if I don't pay you. If you put in your tractor and it's worth $25,000, you bet $25,000 worth of tractor. So if you contribute to a startup and you're not paid, you're essentially betting on the future profits or capital gains of that startup. So you think about it that way, all you got to do is keep track of the bets and you know exactly what your equity split should be. That's the basis of slicing pie. Okay. So how, um, so just kind of help us out here. How should equity be divided amongst co-founders and investors and early employees? Um, give us, I, I, so I, I appreciate the poker example. I mean, the blackjack example, because that makes that makes it easy to understand the slicing pie model. Um, but let's yeah. talk about like a, a real world example. How are you fairly using your model to spread equity amongst different players and different types of players? So there's three basic kinds of contributors to a startup company. Okay. There's the startup team, which I call a grunt. It's called a grunt fund sometimes. Startup team member is someone who contributes to a startup and is not paid for the contribution, whether it be time or materials or money, they're not reimbursed for expenses. That's a startup team member. And you can call them a founder or an early employee, whatever you want. If someone's contributing and not getting paid, they're placing bets just like anybody else. So I could call you my employee, but if you're placing bets, you're treated the same as me and sizing by. Mm -hmm. The second okay. kind of investor a contributor is called an angel investor. An angel investor is someone who invests their own money in amounts that are too small to fund your operations in the foreseeable future. So chunks of cash, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, maybe 100,000, small chunks of cash, my own money. The third type of investor is a professional investor who invests large chunks of money of other people's money in chunks that are large enough to fund your operations. that are usually known as a VC. Those are the three types of equity investors. Now there's credit card debt and Thread and all kinds of other things. Those, those are the three right, right. investors. So anyone participating in the company and making contributions without being paid is considered a participant in the slicing pie model. They, you keep track of their bets. When you can pay them, the betting stops. So if, if, if I paid you a full market salary, you wouldn't deserve any equity in the company, right? Mm -hmm. You're just getting paid. In fact, that, that's how most people work. They just get paid and that's that. But if you're not getting paid, you, you deserve a chunk of equity that, that, that's based on your, your bet. An angel investor should always get a convertible note. Convertible note is one that is, is basically a loan that at a certain point in the future turns into equity at the, at the terms of the first major round of funding. Mm -hmm. The reason that's important is because if you set a price for your equity too early, you create all kinds of problems. And a lot of people give their mom 5% for $5,000, for instance. Right. Or give the early investor. When I sell 5% for $5,000, I just implied that my company is worth $100,000. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now when I give equity, future equity grants, it, 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 it can be taxed at, as income because it has a price now. Plus, I, I basically create a budget of $95,000 that when I run through is gone. And so it creates all kinds of problems. So the first VC round, the first a, Series A round should be your first priced round. So you use slicing pie for founders and early employees that are taking risk. And that's the poker, the, the, the blackjack example. So yep. my share of the equity is based on my share of the, of the, of the, of the bets. I give angel investors convertible notes that will convert later on. And when they convert, all the pie holders will dilute appropriately on equal footing. So everyone's in the, in the same boat. Because my dollars always work at the same, worth the same as your dollar, no matter if I'm the founder or the early employee. Mm -hmm. so all I got to do is keep track of what I contribute. Now, a lot of startups don't do that. They don't keep track of their expenses because they don't have any expenses because they're just working for free. But most companies track payroll, they track expenses, they track revenue. So as, as a matter of how you run a company, tracking these things is not very hard. So all you got to yeah. do is track you're not paid and then you'll all do your bet. So what's going on is you don't know your split up front. You, don't know, you only know when the betting stops. That's a, pay, that's a series A or break even. So the split changes over time, which makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But if you think about it, all equity splits change because if you go in 50-50, we're going to adjust it sooner or later. Mm hmm Okay. The only thing that's so, guaranteed is you always have what you deserve. So, so if I'm a health innovator 
and I um, want to hire a consultant to help me with commercializing my innovation, um, my go-to-market strategy, maybe product development, any of those things that this consultant's going to help me with. Um, and I, of course, I imagine that it depends on the status of the funding of the company. Um, but what do you do when there's a scenario where there's some financial compensation and then there's the balance or there's a difference in equity? Well, you don't know the equity yet because you're not giving equity away yet. You're, you're just tracking the pie. And it's based on the unpaid portion. So if the consultant's $100 an hour and you pay him $50 an hour, they're betting $50 an hour. Okay. You always ask yourself the same question. If I was going to pay this person a full fair market wage or compensation, what would I pay? Make a good financial decision. And then you just pay it if you have the cash. If not, you slice it. So whatever I can't pay, I bet so either all or part of it. I uh, use slices. So, so slices is like, a, is like a poker chip. It's like a fictional unit that contributes to contribute slices to the pie. So this allows me to hire consultants or employees or landlords and rent space. It creates sort of this alternative currency, which says, I owe you, I, you, you, you contributed something, you, you're betting something. I'm going to keep track by allocating slices in my pie. And when the pie stops accumulating slices, we'll determine our equity split based on that. So as you've worked with entrepreneurs, what are, you, you know, when you're explaining this, do, do people get it? Um, if, if not, like, what are some of the, the challenges that you're still facing with, um, you know, gaining adoption of this model amongst entrepreneurs? Well, there's three reasons why someone would not use slicing pie. The first reason is they don't get it. And it's my job to do stuff like this and teach people how to do it. Um, I've got all kinds of resources. I've, I've written three books on this topic. I have board games designed and spreadsheets and software and all kinds of ways to get it. And once board someone, games, that sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, I use it for my classes. You actually, you, you, you play cards and they have different things that you contributed. So it shows things. So, um, so it's an online game. My job in life is to teach everyone how this works. And once okay. you click, once you get it, once you realize there's only one version of fairness that exists, then you'll see that Slicing Pie is, is the best tool for uncovering that version of fairness. Sure. The other reason someone wouldn't want to use this is because they're not willing to learn it. And there's lots of people like that. They just don't want to learn something new. I'm an angel investor. Give my 5% and that's all I want to do. I want to, I want to, I want to know what I'm getting, which is impossible because things change all the time. Yep. But if someone's not willing to learn it, my best advice is to walk away from that person. And the third type, which is a little more interesting, is someone who does get it, but is their intent to take advantage of you. <laughs> so an example of this is a, is a, is a, like a consultant, maybe or like a designer, maybe worth fifty thousand dollars a year, and it lasts for a hundred thousand dollars a year in slices. And you may not find anybody else else willing to work for free, but they want they want to take slices at a higher rate. Yep. They're willing to take advantage of you, and sometimes you gotta you gotta do this. You know, if, if you're desperate and you need cash, you need help, you're you will, will do things. Once you do get the cash, you can replace that employee with a lower cost employee. Um, but you know. The, the, the big barriers are this, this notion that equity changes over time. People have this strong desire to know what they're going to get. And they think if they, if they do what's called a fixed equity split, a 50-50 split or 25-25-20, and they think that they, if they do that, they'll somehow know what they get. But they can't know what they're going to get because things are going to change. You can't predict the future. Any number you pick in advance, no matter what it is, no matter how careful you are, it's going to be the wrong number because it does not properly reflect your, 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 your risk. And sure. People know that inherently. They say, "Gosh, you know, we agreed to 50-50. That doesn't matter. Just because we agreed to it doesn't make it right. What's right is that my share of the best. So, so if you have 50-50 and you you don't want to change that, even though I'm taking more risk than you, that means you're willing to take benefit from my risk. That's not really fair. Sure. Mm hmm. So tell us a little bit more about these resources and um, web tools that you have that you know our audience may be interested in. <clears throat> Well, the important thing to remember is slicing pie is free. It's free to use. I, I, I own some intellectual property there, but there's no license to use slicing pie in your company. There's no uh, barriers to use it. There's free resources, there's free videos on the internet. You can download a free version of my uh, sample of my book. There's some free Excel spreadsheets you can download and worksheets, and you can get, there's a lot of lawyers that offer templates and things like that. So there's no cost to using slicing pie. That being said, there's also books you can buy that are more comprehensive and there's software on my website where you can track your 
contributions over time. So each person can log in and track their contributions. So I worked six hours a day or I paid for a plane ticket that I wasn't reimbursed for. It's kind of the software is much better than Excel in the same way that QuickBooks is better for accounting than Excel is for accounting. Sure. Just helps you. That was going to be one of my next questions was, you know, how complex, <clears throat> you know, obviously entrepreneurs are wearing a million different hats, right? And so time is their most precious asset. So how are they keeping track and making sure that they don't file behind and, you know, some of these uh, slices don't get misappropriated, um, you know, inadvertently over time just because it's, uh, you know, how are they managing it all? Well, if someone's working full time, the traditional way to pay that person is to give them a you know, salary every, every, every Friday, every month, for instance. So in the software, you'd set up a payroll that's just said you know, on a recurring contribution of X number of hours per week every Friday. So they're just you're going to track anything. If you want to track by hour, you can track by hour. But most people are used to, you know, tracking their expense report, for instance. Mm-hmm. Most people are used to tracking payroll. They're not, they're not unbelievable things. You know how much you get paid on a weekly basis. So you're just, you're just tracking things you would track anyway in a regular company. In fact, this feature of the model gives you great insight to what your company is all about because if you're not tracking these things, you don't understand your cost structure. One of the biggest mistakes I see entrepreneurs make is, hey, our cost structure is really low, so we're going to charge low prices and undercut the competition. But because they're not tracking what their, their, non-cash, their, their non, non-expenditures are, they don't really know the cost of their company. Once you fully load it with salaries, you realize that you can't charge a low. I, I teach a lot of students. Student teams will say, we're not getting paid so we can charge a lower price. They all want $50,000 a year. So once you load up $400,000 in salaries, all of a sudden you got to sell a hell of a lot more units to make that amount of money back right. to dynamics. So going, keeping track gives you much more insight to your company and, and the things you should be tracking anyway. Okay. So, so kind of just weaving into a little bit more of your experience with teaching entrepreneurship. Um, so, I would say probably about 60% of our audience is health innovators that are in the trenches and um, in some stage of growth of their company. Um, Some of them have just an idea. Others are actually in the marketplace and they're really gaining adoption. And actually some of them have already exited and now they're on to their next big thing. Um, And then the other um, segment of our audience is a lot of like more of the bigger enterprise, what I would call early adopters. So like health plans, hospital systems that the innovators are selling to and then key influencers. Um, But it's kind of speaking to your experience with teaching entrepreneurship. What are some other lessons um, or recommendations that you would have for our health innovators that are listening today? Well, when it comes to investments and equity and and things like that, there's often intellectual property that goes along with health health innovation. And and the the whole idea of what's an idea worth is a really important thing to think about. Um, People who have ideas for businesses often think that their ideas are worth billions of dollars. And you'll see this in like tech transfer universities. You know, I have an idea for a new medical device. And so I want you to develop it. I'll give you 5% of the equity and I'll keep 95% and do nothing. <clears throat> um, that's extremely common. They think mm-hmm. it's worth a lot. But properly valuing an idea in a startup is a really important uh, is discipline. Ideas that have value if they're somehow fixed in space in the form of a copyright, a trademark, a patent, or some kind of trade secret. And it has to be developed enough that it's worth something. If it's fixed in space and licensable to somebody, then it's worth what the license is worth. So if I have an idea for medical device, I want to start a new company and I could, I could license it to Pfizer for 5% on revenues, then that's the fair market value of the idea. Okay. So what's nice about that is I license the idea to the startup. They can either pay me cash or use slices in the pie if they can't pay me. If they pivot away from my idea, that means my idea didn't work. And because I was paying a royalty, I won't get a royalty because my idea didn't work. It can start pivot all the time. So if I give a big chunk of equity, a random number of equity chunk for an idea, and then I pivot away from that idea, I got somebody who gave me a bad idea who has a chunk of equity in the company. Right. So we've got to think of in terms of what's the, what's the license, what's the royalty to get. If I can't find anybody to pay for my idea, it's probably not worth something. You know, if I, if I have an idea and there's no, 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 no one else to license it, it's worthless. Things are either, they don't have, if, I, if I can't ask you in a price, it's either worthless or it's priceless. Either way, I'm kind of stuck. Yep. The other thing about ideas is, is it's usually our job to have good ideas. So if I'm on a startup team and I am tracking my, my salary that I'm not getting paid and slicing by, 
having good ideas is my job. So you don't, you just don't get royalties for job ideas you have on the job. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. used to work in the fishing tackle box industry and it was my job to have awesome ideas. And I invented new products that people use all over the world, but I don't get a royalty on that because it was my job to come up with, you know, I was the marketing VP. So <laughs> right. it was just part of my job. So it's, it's a value of ideas. The second thing to keep in mind when it comes to healthcare is usually once you get to a certain point, it needs a lot of capital. So startups, you know, may need a lot of capital right up front. So slicing pie is good for those this early days before you raise capital. When you raise capital or reach break even, you can pay people their contributions for their contributions and you don't need equity. Um, so if I, and I, and I have this, you know, I, I have a team of people that work for me that I pay them full America, full fair market salary and they don't get equity. That's fine with them because they're getting paid in full. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Um, once you raise the money, you don't need to use equity in your company to in, provide incentives. That's a big mistake people make is they, they hire people and they give them equity. Equity in a startup is like equity in any other, other company. If I get paid a full fair market salary, I can determine what I do with that salary. I can put it in the bank, I can spend it on Cheetos, or I can invest it in the stock market or in yeah. other investments. So investing in so the same decisions should apply to my startup equity. If I'm not willing to buy the equity with my salary or my income, then it's not worth anything to me. So giving it to me isn't worthwhile. So it's something that's pretty good to think about. The third thing to keep in mind is this, uh, this idea where like, big companies want to invest in R&D through the startup community. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm a big, you know, big, I'm Abbott Labs and I want to invest in startups to get the intellectual property from them or to, to find good ideas. Slicing Pie is a wonderful tool for doing that because what it allows you to do is just ha- you, you have your fund and all you do is pay people's bills on the way. You just join a company. As you pay their bills, you get slices in the pie. And if you like them and things are going well, you keep paying their bills and keep earning equity and get them to break even. If you don't like them, you just stop working with them. Mm-hmm. What that avoids is this whole, this whole song and dance about the pitch and negotiating terms and uh, giving them chunks of cash that they just spend through and then having debt equity. So traditional equity models are, 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 are difficult to manage at the early stages because they require this big commitment from an angel investor, a commitment from a, you do a big business plan pitch. If you like a team, you can slice them out as you just start investing them immediately. So, so, you know, it's interesting. I'm starting to see a growing number of health innovators who are um, wanting to kind of avoid the traditional funding route and self-fund and, and kind of adopt more of the slicing pile model and, and really just kind of weather through that storm um, um, being bootstrapped for years um, until they actually start generating revenue and cash flow and just avoid it. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in a traditional model, I, gotta, I, I, have, to, I have 100% that I can give away. Mm-hmm. If I start chunking out little bits of that, once the 100% is gone, it's gone. And so if I give you 5% for your marketing efforts and I give you my landlord 2% and 3%, I just keep doing that. that, that it's, it's, it's a finite resource. Yep. So I chunk it away and chunk it away. And that makes it very difficult. With slicing pie, I can add an endless number of slices to the pie. And everyone knows they get exactly what they deserve. So I can acquire the resources I need for a much longer period of time before I run out of juice, for instance. Mm-hmm. So slicing pie is a much, much more logical way to divide up equity because if I don't pay for someone for a contribution, I just use slices. And the whole time I'm making good financial decisions. I don't go out and rent ten thousand dollars a month for office space. I rent five hundred dollars. <laughs> right, right. So I just keep, you know, and the spending continues until I no longer need it. So it gives people a long ramp up period for um, for bootstrapping. It's a much easier tool to use because no matter what changes, you will always be fair. And it also gives you an idea that the size of your pie gives you an idea of what kinds of contributions were necessary to get to you where you are today. So you realize you have ten million slices in your pie. To get to MVP, that's pretty expensive to get to an MVP, so you got to be very careful about moving forward. So it gives you good decision-making tools. Sure. Yeah, that's great. So is there anything else that you would want to share with our listeners? The, the important thing to keep in mind about equity splits in bootstrap companies is that there's only one version of fairness. If our dad gives us a cookie, you and I, we're, we're now our sister and brother, and he says, split it up, kids. The only fair way to split the cookie is 50-50, right? Mm-hmm. You break it in half. I break it in half and you pick which half you want, right? Now, I could give you my half of the cookie, but my generosity doesn't make it more fair. Right. You could steal my half of the cookie, 
But your greed doesn't make it more fair. Sorry. <laughs> What's fair is 50-50. Now, if you bought the cookie, you can do whatever you want with it. If I bought the cookie, I can do it. So, so there's only one version of fairness. There's no other way to split the cookie. And once you keep that in mind, you'll realize that when you are with a company, that's a, determine that as a possibility. So any other method, any other model I use is by definition going to be unfair because it's an alternative to the true one fairness that there is. So keeping that in mind, uh, I hope your listeners will take the time to listen to to look at SliceyPie. There's a free sample on my website, SliceyPie.com, and give it a chance because it definitely works. It's worked all over the world. Uh, we just launched SliceyPies.ir in Iran. No way. He's an example of it's been transferred to, transferred into Persian. So even in very different cultures and economy, in economies, it works just the same. It's only one version. It's a universal model. Are you seeing... Um... That's interesting. Are you seeing kind of um, adoption of the model more prevalent in some markets versus others or some countries versus others or um, some verticals? Um, I, don't have, I don't know of any uh, instances in North Korea, but other than that, <laughs> the, right. the books have transcended to over a dozen different languages. I got lawyers all over the world who do it. Yeah. Um, it always works exactly the same, no matter what, what happens. It's, it's, it's universal. So, so if you're based in, United States, you can work with people in India using the exact same model. It's always the same. So it always works. Lawyers estimate that the ones that I talk to, and I talk to a lot of lawyers, they estimate that 60 to 80% of all the equity deals they do wind up in dispute that requires legal intervention. That means the chance of us winding up hiring a lawyer to fix our equity split is greater than the chance of it not happening. Right. In the 10 years or so since I launched Slicing Pie, it's been used all over the world by thousands of startups. I have yet to hear of a single instance that Slicify couldn't solve the problem for them. That's incredible. I love the work that you're doing. And I think it's so uh, relevant to our listeners. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. So how can folks get a hold of you? I know you talked about the website, but what if they want to connect with you? Yeah, uh, slicingpie.com is the website. If they fill the form on the contact form, my guys will forward it to me, or they can email me at mike at slicingpie.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you. What's the difference between launching and commercializing a healthcare innovation? Many people will launch a new product, few will commercialize it. To learn the difference between launch and commercialization and to watch past episodes of the show, head to our video show page at drroxy.com. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the show. You can subscribe to the latest episodes on your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, or subscribe to the video episodes on our YouTube channel. No matter the platform, just search COIQ with Dr. Roxy. Until next time, let's raise our COIQ.